Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in a typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from the cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I'd love for you to give me a follow. Today, we have a truly informative episode in store for you. I'm joined by very special guest, Dr. Angel Chu, an infectious disease physician, clinical assistant professor at Cumming School of Medicine, Calgary Medical Director of Calgary STI Clinic, and Vice Chair Immunize Canada. She is here to unravel the mystery surrounding HPV, a virus that affects millions worldwide and plays a crucial role in our sexual health and well-being. In today's convo, we'll have an in-depth discussion about the world of HPV, what it is, how it spreads, and its impact on our health. We'll dive into the risks, complications, and symptoms of HPV, including its connection to cancer. And this isn't just a concern for one gender. We'll also explore the male perspective of HPV. Why should men care about the virus and what are the potential risks they could face? Angel will shed light on the treatment and management options available for HPV infections, including safe sex practices and how they play a significant role in preventing HPV transmission. And before we jump into today's episode, I would like to do my land acknowledgement. In this space we gather, let us pay our respects. With deep gratitude and humility, I acknowledge that I live, work, play, and I am recording this episode on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. I also honor the Sutina Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Region 3. I am committed to fostering a spirit of reconciliation and understanding and acknowledge the enduring connection between Indigenous people and their ancestral lands. May I tread this path with respect, recognizing the importance of Indigenous knowledge and culture. Before we embark on our conversation, let's take a moment to ground ourselves in the present with this short somatic inquiry. If this is something that's not of interest to you, you may just fast forward a few minutes. But if this is something you're curious about, I invite you to listen in. So when you feel ready, perhaps closing your eyes, inviting a little more pleasure, comfort into your body, and just choosing whether you want to sit, lay on the floor, stand, and just noticing your breath. Taking a deep breath in as you inhale, allowing some stress or tension or tightness to melt away. Now bringing your awareness to your body, perhaps noticing the sensation of the chair supporting you or the ground beneath your feet. Maybe noticing if the floor has rug or carpet, if it's hardwood. And noticing the rhythm of your breath. Now imagine a warm, comforting light cascading over you, starting at the crown of your head, slowly moving down, bathing each part of your body in soothing energy. As this light waves through your body, perhaps bringing a sense of calm, relaxation. As we dive into this topic of HPV awareness today, I invite you to consider your own body as a source of wisdom. What messages might it have for you about your health, your boundaries, your well-being? What sensations arise as you think about taking control of your sexual health? Taking a few more moments to breathe, connect with your body. And when you're ready, gently opening your eyes. And let's begin our discussion. Welcome, Angel, to the show today. So happy to have you here. 
Thank you very much, Tara. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I admit I'm a little bit nervous interviewing you today. Oh. I, I did some research and now I'm like fangirling and noticing my heart's like racing a little bit. Oh. <laughs> well, you're too kind, but <laughs> hopefully it's not because I'm intimidating. No, I, I, I just admire all the work that you're doing and that you're an empowering woman in this field. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I've, I've been in this field. It doesn't seem like it's that long, but you know, when I count up the years, it certainly has been. So I'm curious if there's anything I may have missed in the intro that you feel is important to bring into this conversation right now, or if you want to just kind of jump in to this HPV discussion. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, we, we can just jump in. But, uh, you know, I just, I'm so grateful that, you know, you're dedicating this segment uh, to this very important topic because HPV, unfortunately, is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections. And it is, it's such a shame because it is so highly preventable, not only in terms of the diseases that it causes, but also all of the complications, including cancers. So hopefully through this program, we can make all of your audience uh, more aware and um, and strategies on how they can protect themselves against this potentially deadly infection. Yeah. Oh my God. So much great information. I'm excited for people to hear this too. And maybe for folks who aren't as aware about STIs, maybe touching on what HPV is, because some people know HSV, they might think, oh, HSV and HPV, it's the same thing. Like, What's the difference? Yes, very, very different. So HPV is the cold nose version, a human papillomavirus. And it is, as I mentioned, one of the most common sexually transmitted infections out there. And the reason why it is so common is because it's transmitted through skin contact. So unlike a lot of the STIs that we worry about, a lot of the other STIs are transmitted through mucous membranes. But whereas HPV is just on the skin and, and people can have HPV throughout their entire body. And it's not just in the genital areas, but they can have it in their mouth. They can have it on their hands. They can have it on their feet. And that's why you typically see a lot of children who have warts on their hands and feet. And it's because it's just spread through skin contact. And because of that, uh, a lot of people don't know that they have HPV on their skin. And so they unknowingly, or in clinical terms, what we say, asymptomatically transmit it to other people. And it's just, it doesn't require any kind of sexual activity. It can just be through skin contact. Something as simple as touching um, or kissing can transmit HPV. And once you become infected, unfortunately, there's no uh, treatment for it. We can only kind of watch and see. And over time, if somebody develops disease from the HPV infection, well, then we know. And then we can treat the disease manifestations. But there's no medication um, that I can give somebody to get rid of that HPV virus. And similarly, there's no test that I can offer somebody to detect whether or not they have come in contact with someone with HPV either. Wow. So it's ubiquitous and it's very common. And unfortunately, out of eight, uh, eight out of every 10 Canadians, it's estimated, will have at least one HPV infection in their lifetime. That is... That's all news to me, actually. I'm sitting here as like a sex educator and I did some research and it was like 90% of people, I think it said, have yeah. Yeah. at least some form of HPV and there is no test, say. Hey? No, unfortunately not. And that's the other thing that most mm -hmm. people aren't aware of. So they'll come into my STI clinic and they'll want, quote unquote, like a full STI checkup. Um, and they think that, you know, they're being screened for everything, HPV included. And unfortunately, there isn't um, any kind of test. So there's no swab that I can do. There's no blood test that I can offer. Um, and there's, you know, no kind of radiology test or anything like that to detect that HPV infection. So for that reason, unfortunately, yeah, it just keeps getting spread and transmitted and propagated from person to person to person. And it doesn't um, require that intimate sexual contact. It's just through skin. So even touching. And it doesn't matter if somebody has one partner or 100 partners. You know, all it takes is one to uh, get into contact with HPV. 
And unfortunately, after somebody gets an HPV infection, they may not know it for many uh, for a long time and sometimes even years and decades. So it takes in some, um, depending on the strain of HPV that one acquires, it can take years and years to manifest and sometimes even decades. Wow. And very similar to HSV, actually. Yes, exactly. And that can like impact relationships and marriages because, you know, 10, 12 years down the road, you're with somebody and then all of a sudden you're noticing that you have HPV and there might be the other partners like, my God, you cheated on me. How did this happen? And there's just not enough. There's so much stigma attached to it that, I, I mean, really, there's not much out there for information unless people know they have it, then they start looking for the information. Yes, exactly. And you raise such an important point. And that's something that I commonly hear from patients in my clinic, where you're exactly correct, they'll be in a relationship for many, many years, they'll think it's stable, they'll think and it may be uh, monogamous. Uh, But again, that has no bearing. And one of the partners may end up either developing a genital ward. Or for a woman, she may develop an abnormal pap smear, which is one of the um, earliest signs of HPV infections. Uh, And then they'll wonder, well, has there been infidelity in the relationship? And then there's a lot of blame, a lot of questions, a lot of mistrust. And sometimes that unfortunately leads to the breakdown of a relationship. But it's uh, for no good reason other than a lack of education, where most people just don't realize that from the time of getting HPV infection, it can be years or decades after that infection before disease will manifest. So it doesn't mean that they necessarily would have acquired that HPV from their current partner. It could have been from uh, one of their first sexual partners or you know later ones. And you can't ever go back in time, is what I tell patients, and figure out exactly you know when and where you acquired the HPV infection, we can only know that you acquired it at some point in your life. And there's no time frame that we can pinpoint, unfortunately. So if you have an abnormal path, does every abnormal path mean that you have HPV? Virtually, yes, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> so we know that, well, the reason why women get pap smears is to detect for those precancerous changes that certain strains of HPV can cause. And with the abnormal pap smears, uh, we know that over 99% of all of the cervical cancers that are caused worldwide are caused by an HPV virus. So if you think about that in kind of in different terms, it means that because we know what's causing cervical cancer, which we can't say for certainty with other types of cancers, for example, you know, breast cancers or, uh, you know, bladder cancers or other types of cancers, we don't know what causes those cancers. But with cervical cancers and in um, a high proportion of oropharyngeal cancers, we know that they're caused by the HPV virus. So if we can eliminate the HPV virus, then we can eliminate virtually all the cervical cancers that we see worldwide, which is an astounding feat. So how does one eliminate HPV? (laughs) Well, thankfully, (laughs) there are numerous strategies. So first and foremost, we always, of course, advise patients and the public to engage in safe sex practices. And the number one way of doing that is, of course, through condom use. And condoms are are fantastic for HPV prevention. But unfortunately, when we look at, uh, you know, for example, male condoms, they only cover the area where the condom can cover. And that's in a a male condom, it's just the penis. Whereas I mentioned earlier, HPV can be on any skin surface. So the areas that the condom doesn't cover, those can potentially be sites of transmission. So for example, the scrotum, the inner thigh, the buttock, um, the mouth, anywhere, hands, et cetera. But of course, we always um, encourage uh, and strongly recommend safe sex practices, but then, and to abstain from sex when somebody has, you know, like an active uh, genital ward, for example, because that's the time of highest uh, infectivity where there's most HPV virus quantities there. But then other things like, you know, healthy lifestyle, you know, quitting smoking because we know that smoking can impair the immune system. And Wait, does that include smoking based? Uh, not so much smoking vapes. Okay. <laughs> I guess the, the research is still early to see how much vape uh, smoking, but that's a great point. Uh, but cannabis use uh, certainly can suppress the immune system. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So, but it's usually, you know, some kind of uh, the traditional smoke use, like tobacco and cigarette use. Um, okay. Yeah, marijuana products. But yeah, that can suppress the immune system. But then the, so, you know, to have a, a you know, healthy lifestyle per se, just to keep, you know, uh, good practices and to have a uh, good functioning immune system. But the biggest way to prevent uh, HPV is through HPV vaccines, of which there are several available. But HPV vaccines have completely been a game changer for HPV prevention, where if given early before somebody acquires HPV infections, HPV vaccines have been shown to prevent over 90% of all HPV infections that are contained within the vaccine. Wow, Mm -hmm. that's incredible. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why for that reason, we tend to um, vaccinate boys and girls in school based programs. And sometimes, you know, parents object and say, well, you know, my child is too young, you know, why do we need to give them the HPV vaccine when they're not even sexually active? Well, that's the exact reason why we want to vaccinate at a young age is because if we use it prior to HPV infections, then we know it has such high efficacy at over 90% reduction in HPV infections from the strains included in the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But not only that, but even if somebody has become infected with HPV, it's never too late because somebody can still get an HPV vaccine after an HPV infection or disease and still get significant benefit. Interesting. So me being 36, I was part of the group that was not vaccinated in school. Is it like worth it for somebody my age to get the vaccine? Absolutely. And that's something that I recommend every patient that I see in the STI clinic. I recommend that they get the HPV vaccine because we know that HPV vaccines protect against uh, all of the strains that are included in the vaccine. And there's some vaccines that protect against two strains. There's some vaccines that protect against four strains of HPV and some that protect against nine strains of HPV. And we know that most people, if they were to have an HPV infection, usually have one or two strains um, of infection at most. So it's unlikely that somebody would have been exposed to all the different strains that are included in the vaccine. And so for that reason, they can get protection from the strains to which they were not already exposed. And not only that, But we also know that after somebody clears their HPV infection, they can become re-exposed to it again, and they can get another infection down the road. So by getting the vaccine, they can prevent another reinfection. And not only that, but there's also a lot of data showing that if somebody gets the HPV vaccine after treatment of disease, then it actually reduces the risk of recurrence. So for example, a woman who may have an abnormal pap smear or have has already had cervical cancer, if we then give them the HPV vaccine, we can reduce the risk that they'll have another abnormal pap smear, or we can reduce the risk that their wart will come back, or uh, we can actually reduce the chances that their cancer can come back too. So okay. there's many, many reasons why we recommend that everybody uh, get vaccinated, regardless of past exposure to HPV vac- the viruses in the past. Yeah, I had one question that came up when I was telling my my girlfriend that I was interviewing you. So she has had abnormal paps and what, what's it called when you go, have to go for that procedure after oh, colposcopy. Yes. So she went for her second one and she was recommended to get the new HPV vaccine. Cause she got it in her early twenties and they're like, they've changed the vaccines changed. So it's worth looking into getting an additional vaccine. Mm-hmm. Yes, Is that yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And okay. I would strongly support that. So you're absolutely correct. So uh, HPV vaccines, the, the HPV vaccine that protects against four strains of HPV were uh, first licensed in 2006. And then in 2008, Eight, the vaccine that protects against two strains came out. And then in 2010, a new vaccine came out that protects against nine different strains of HPV. Now, all three of the different vaccines protect against HPV uh, 16 and 18, which are the most common strains that cause cancers. Whereas the uh, HPV vaccine that protects against four strains and nine strains 
They also contain protection against strains uh, 6 and 11, which cause about 90% of the genital warts. So if your girlfriend received um, an HPV vaccine before 2010, she would have received the older ones, in which case it's highly worthwhile to become to get another vaccine with the uh, HPV vaccine that covers against nine strains, because those additional strains in the newer vaccines since 2010 protect against another 20% of HPV strains that cause cancers. Yeah. So it's highly worthwhile. Yeah. And w- curiosity, like what's the cost for that in Canada? I can't. Yeah. Yeah. So in Canada, it depends on uh, the pharmacy that you go to, but roughly it's three doses. Um, you get your first, then two months later, you get your second. And then four months later, you get your third. So is that a zero, two and six month schedule? And it's estimated again, depending on the pharmacy that you go to, but roughly it's about $200 per dose. Now, yeah, no, and it's a lifetime of protection against warts as well as cancers. And it's not just cervical cancer. As much as we talk about cervical cancer protection for women, it's actually the males who are in high need of HPV vaccines and protection as well. Because in women, we have things like crop smears that can actually detect those precancerous changes before a woman progresses to that cervical cancer stage. Whereas with all of the other types of cancers caused by HPV, there's no such screening program. And um, there's data showing that uh, particularly um, in the US and in Canada as well, that the rates of oral pharyngeal cancers in males has has risen so uh, quickly that now HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancers in males is the number one HPV cancer. So it surpasses cervical cancer in women. So that's oral cancer, basically, like cancer in your mouth. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not the oral cavity, but it's oral pharyngeal. So it's uh, in the mouth. So areas of the mouth that aren't typically looked at. So that includes the tongue, the base of the tongue, the tonsils, and into the throat as well. So when you go to your dentist for a checkup, you know, they'll feel around, they'll look for, you know, abnormal masses, etc. But that's the oral cavity, whereas the HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancers are areas of the mouth that aren't typically looked at. And unfortunately, with oropharyngeal cancers, it's um, because it's, uh, first of all, not uh, examined commonly, there's no screening uh, program to detect those precancerous changes. So if a cancer were to happen, it usually progresses very quickly because in that head and neck area, it's close to the lymph nodes. And so it spreads to the lymph nodes. And then from there, it spreads through the, the entire body because it goes through the blood. And then so oftentimes oropharyngeal cancers aren't diagnosed until the later stages, in which case it's usually um, has a very, very high mortality rate. Um, and even if somebody survives that oropharyngeal cancer, the surgeries and the radiation and the chemotherapy are so intensively brutal that there's a lot of disfigurement. And unfortunately of the survivors of oropharyngeal cancers, they unfortunately end up dying later from suicide just because of how horrific the oropharyngeal cancer treatment was. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of the marketing is usually targeted at women and men don't even know that they should. And, you know, most men don't go to the doctor. They don't even have a family doctor who's like trying to talk to them about potentially getting this life-saving vaccine or ways to even prevent it. I mean, not only is it impacting them, but like their partners or people that they are being sexual with, like, you know, oral Mm -hmm. sex. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And and you raise such an important point where there's been so much attention and focus towards HPV prevention and screening programs for women, but it's the males um, that just there's so little education and awareness, not only from uh, the, the general public's perspective, but even from the aspect of a healthcare professional. Even when I talk to, you know, doctors and nurses and pharmacists, most people aren't even aware that men are in need of HPV vaccines. And so we're, you know, even despite a lot of education and awareness over the years, 
most uh, healthcare professionals aren't even aware of it. So it requires, uh, you know, combined effort. And through initiatives like this, hopefully we can make the public more aware of their risk and strategies to mitigate uh, HPV infections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not only the throat, the mouth, your vulva, like also the anus too. Sometimes yes. that is forgotten when we're yes. talking about sex yes. and safe sex. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's take a step back here. So we know that HPV, um, there's over a hundred different strains of HPV. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but of the ones that cause clinical disease, I mentioned six and 11 cause about 90% of the genital warts that we see. And then 16 and 18 cause about 70% of the cervical cancers, as well as anal cancers in both men and women and the oropharyngeal cancers, vulvar cancers, vaginal cancers. But yeah, those are commonly attributed to HPV infections as well. And we know that with anal cancers, I mean, Farrah Fawcett famously passed away from uh, anal cancers. Uh, Michael Douglas, uh, he was quite open about it. He had HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer, for which he required extensive surgery and um, chemotherapy and radiation. But yes, anal cancers, uh, not only in men, but also in women as well. Now, we know that there's a certain population of men who are at higher risk of anal cancers, and that's the men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. where their risk of anal cancers is about triple or quadruple the risk of uh, somebody who is uh, who has, uh, a man who, have sex, who has sex with women. So it's that particular men who have sex with men who are at the highest risk of anal cancers. And then within that subset, it's the HIV positive men who have sex with men who are at the absolute highest risk. Because your immune system is... Yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. The immune system. And unfortunately, yeah, there's just no routinely available screening programs that are widely available. Mm -hmm. And it's so stigmatized and it's not talked about no. and it's awkward and people don't want to ask. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know. It's just, unfortunately, STIs are not a sexy thing to talk about. I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Even like, so how do, how do you have that safe sex talk? Like what are some good conversations to initiate before you're getting sexy with someone? Mm -hmm. One I like is, Hey, have you had cold sores before? Yeah, so not like it doesn't matter where it is. I want to know, are you taking bell tracks? Like, yeah, great. And, and, you know, I think you highlight a really, really important point there. And it's just to be proactive about your own health, because, you know, you can't rely on other people. And at the end of the day, it's your health. Don't be shy about it. Take ownership of it um, and advocate for yourself. So, you know, if you're uh, in a new relationship or meeting a new partner, there's nothing wrong with posing the questions just as you say, right? Are you on Valtrex? Have you ever had a cold sore? Have you ever had an STI? Or, you know, do you mind if we go uh, to the STI clinic and just get a full checkup first, right? Those are things, important strategies that somebody can do to mitigate their own personal risk. And then in addition to that, of course, being proactive and vaccinating yourself against HPV, mm -hmm. right? Because that is the number one way to prevent HPV infections. Uh, so if, you know, a partner or a prospective partner is unsure of whether or not they had HPV infections before or had, uh, you know, disease or been exposed to HPV, well, one of the simplest ways to protect yourself is if you get vaccinated. So that's one of the things that I strongly recommend all patients get. Mm hmm yeah. And, you know, I come, my lineage for sex education comes from non-monogamy. That's how I started teaching it was having a non-monogamous relationship myself. And, you know, people have their apps and they're like, oh, I upload my panel onto here. And I'm like, that doesn't include HPV or HSV, which yeah. those are, you have that forever. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so good job that you went and got tested. But also, I think we need to have a deeper conversation before we get sexy and play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important because with things like, and, you know, with uh, HSV, like a herpes virus, you know, it's again through skin contact. And so a lot of people uh, don't know that they have it either. And so asymptomatic transmission is one of the most common modes of transmission, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like story time with me, I was with somebody who's never had a cold sore and I got HSV one on my 
butthole and like oh. had no idea. And like, I'm trying to be transparent with this and destigmatize that, but like, they didn't know they've never had one in their whole life. And honestly, it doesn't look like what you see on the internet because you look up like herpes and it's like, oh my God, it looks like an ingrown hair and it just like was painful. But yeah. that's how easily and how quickly something like that happens. And then for life, like that's something I have to be transparent and open with and, you know, taking Lysine or Valtrax and having those conversations with people so that they have informed consent when it comes to sexy time. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and Tara, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I mean, it's a good thing for you that you have, you, you know, that you're upfront and transparent, but I can tell you a lot of people aren't, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with talking about it and overcoming that stigma. And so a lot of people may know that they have herpes and choose not to go on Valtrex suppressive medication. And so they're just exposing their, and it's not that they're bad people. It's a personal choice that they have. And they, they feel that their confidentiality and their privacy and no one else has a right to know it and that's a personal choice that they make but at the same time it's also exposing um, their partner and potential partners to other types of infections like herpes and HPV Mm -hmm. so you know your your partner are lucky that you know you are transparent but a lot of people aren't Mm -hmm. so that's why I say that you know it's so uh, important that one takes that own initiative to protect themselves I think also it's just lack of education. Like some people literally don't know a cold sore is herpes. And some people, like I just found out that an abnormal pap means HPV. Yeah, I know. I know. And so many women don't know. And you're not the only one that I've heard that from, but that is so common. So women will go to their their doctor and get pap smears at the recommended intervals. Or sometimes a lot of women don't even bother getting pap smears. But so, you know, time and again, I would estimate that about 70% of women don't even know why they bother, uh, why they're getting pap smears done, which is shocking. Yeah. But I don't blame them because there is a lack of education. If you think back, uh, you know, even when I was growing up, when I went through junior high and high school, sex ed wasn't taught very well. It was taught by teachers who were uncomfortable, um, you know, even bringing the subjects. They kind of just danced around things. They weren't upfront and they didn't have these candid conversations like we're having now. So I feel like, uh, and parents, of course, don't want to have that discussion <laughs> with right. their children. <laughs> And so, you know, where do people turn to for information? The internet is full of misinformation. But, you know, unfortunately, it's like you say, a lot of people don't do their own research and aren't educated until after the fact, until they actually get an STI or they get that HPV and then they educate themselves, which by then it's too late. So that's why, you know, this topic is so important that we're talking about this now so that we can empower and help people protect themselves before it's too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and like HSV, you can take the bell tracks or lysine. I've heard that works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some patients will swear by lysine. You're absolutely correct. Uh, and some people say, you know, they, they took it and there's, it does nothing for them. And they still so, had an outbreak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The one that has the, the most, uh, of course, because I'm a doctor, <laughs> so I say this in the most, uh, the the modality that has the best evidence and best efficacy of, of course, the Valtrex suppressive medication. Is there something like that similar for HPV? Unfortunately, there is not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no pill, there's no cream, there's no lotion, there's no uh, injection that I can give anyone to treat that HPV infection or that virus. The only treatment is if somebody gets HPV disease. So if they get a wart, we can treat the wart. If a woman has an abnormal pap smear, then we can uh, uh, treat it through colposcopy. And usually that requires some kind of a surgical excision. Or if somebody gets cancer, then we can treat the cancer. But there's no treatment for the HPV virus itself. What does genital H- genital wart treatment yeah. look like? Yeah, so usually, um, so there's a couple of methods. So the one that we use in the STI clinic is uh, liquid nitrogen or cryotherapy. So we freeze the wart. 
Oh. Yeah, which is very painful, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so in sensitive areas, especially around the genitals, yeah, it can become very excruciatingly painful. But in addition to the freezing, sometimes we can use topical lotions uh, and creams. Or if somebody wanted to apply a cream at home, they can do so as well. It's called Phyloma or Aldera. It's, uh, the generic name is called Emicomod, where somebody just applies it uh, at bedtime to the wart itself. Uh, it has a slower onset of action than the liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen works quicker, but the topical uh, in Miquamod actually has a lower recurrence rate compared to the liquid nitrogen freezing. Okay. But most of the times when people have warts, they're so you know devastated and they're so horrified by it that they just want the wart gone as soon as possible. So they endure the pain, they endure the inconvenience, and uh, they just keep coming in weekly. Uh, to the clinic to keep getting it frozen. And oftentimes, and I've had patients come in, depending on the size of the wart, uh, they can come in for weeks and weeks, even to months. Sometimes the longest patient I had come in was 10 months. And that's on an every seven day basis. I mean, she was diligent about coming in. Wow. Mm -hmm. That would be so hard. It, it would be. Yeah. And invasive a little bit, like okay, Very. every week, like Oh yeah. On my period. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. And, you know, so it's the stigma of coming into the clinic, sitting in the waiting room. There's the, you know, never mind even like the, the psychological impact, but the mental health impact, the shame, the guilt that they feel, the inconvenience of time off work or time off school, or even just, you know, who likes to sit at a doctor's office, you know, week in and week out waiting for a treatment, right? It's just not pleasant. There's the comfortableness of you know having to to take off your pants or, or whatever area and expose the ward for treatment it's just it's not pleasant at all and that's mm -hmm. why I say uh, prevention is so important because you know once you get that treatment or once that ward or that disease develops it's you know the, the treatment is just not pleasant no matter what the disease is whether it's ward or cancer I'm curious if there's like support systems for folks who are going through like an STI diagnosis or HPV, like a support line or something. Unfortunately, no. So with HSV, there used to be a lot of support groups available, but those are just kind of fallen off them. So there's nothing official, unfortunately. So you're right. And that's such an important thing because so many people are just absolutely devastated once they get any kind of STI diagnosis, especially with herpes and with HPV. And they don't know who to turn to. They don't want to talk to their friends or family because of the stigma. They're embarrassed. And it's not sexy to bring up at dinner parties, of course. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they feel isolated. They're ashamed. And so it just, they go down this rabbit hole of, you know, having nobody to turn to, no supports whatsoever. There's a lot of uh, mental anguish, a lot of mental anxiety. So it's just, you know, all of these negative downstream consequences. So unfortunately, no, there's not a whole lot of resources available for anybody um, who gets, you know, these uh, herpes or HPV diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely experienced that myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I try to provide as much counseling and education and, you know, I always leave my doors open and I always tell patients, you know, you're going to read a lot about it. You're going to be overwhelmed with, you know, uh, all these feelings right after your diagnosis but it will sink in. And once you've had time to process the diagnosis, you're going to have a ton of questions, you're going to be reading a lot of information online. And rather than, you know, turn to, you know, non factual sources and information and read all this other stuff that totally freaks somebody out, um, make a list of all of your questions, and then book another appointment. And then that way, we can address all of your questions at that point. And then that way, I can ensure that all of my patients actually have, you know, proper, you know, legit and factual information. And then also, I can provide that kind of a psychological resource and comfort for them, uh, at least, you know, giving them some kind of psych psychological support, uh, because unfortunately, there's no systemic way um, or systemic system in place to provide that kind of resource for them. It's great that you provide that. I certainly didn't have that. <laughs> it's <Aww. like, laughs> very lost for a while. And then yeah. the more that I kind of started talking to a few friends that I trusted about it, you know, they're like, I have it. And I'm like, oh, 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know. I know. It's one of these crazy things, right? It's just not, unfortunately, like because of the stigma, nobody talks about it. Yeah. But once you're able to open up and find a few trusted uh, friends or confidants to kind of uh, talk about it with, you'll soon realize that, you know what, like a lot of people have it. So it's estimated that about 25 to 30% of the population has herpes. So one in three people have it, but just nobody mm -hmm. talks about it. So it seems like, you know, one of these things where you feel like you're the only person who has it and you feel like this big ogre in the room because you have herpes when in fact, no, it's, it's quite common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And kind of like switching gears then into maybe the future trends of HPV, like what medication might be coming up? I mean, like the vaccines changed from 2006 to what it is now. Is there any new research that seems to be like sprouting some, I don't know, Potential. new things? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? There are, there's always research into different uh, ways to treat HPV. So, um, you know, there's always new creams, whether it's, um, you know, using more plant-based therapies to try to treat HPV to more like chemical compounds in like the usual, you know, scientific uh, way of, you know, manufacturing creams. There's lots under investigation. They've also, um, they're looking at doing things like injections into HPV lesions, so whether it's wards or those uh, precancerous changes, they're looking at doing injections of those. They're looking at uh, new types of HPV vaccines as therapeutic, not as preventative, but as treatment. Um, so there's all sorts of things going on in the HPV world because there's such a need for it because it's so common. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, lots of exciting things to look out for. But yeah, there's always something um, in the science world that's being looked into or being researched. Of course, you know, many times when they trial things or look or do research, many, uh, if not most of those new therapies don't end up coming to fruition. But rest assured that uh, the medical and scientific community are working very, very hard to find new and uh, different ways of prevention and treatment of HPV. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if it's so common, but yet yeah, so can get really complicated really quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Until then, you know, there are strategies to prevent HPV. And one of the best ways is of course, through HPV vaccines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Safe sex practices. They mm -hmm. even have like those new latex underwear now. So have you seen those? <laughs> no, I haven't actually really. No. It's like a dental dam. But it's underwear that you wear. And so like if you're, you know, in, in into kink and you're using a flogger and it's like touching a vulva and yeah. then you, you don't have to like go and clean that flogger that's leather or something, you can just wear these underwear and you still can feel the sensation. I mean, even if you're having oral sex, like they're, yeah. I forget the name of them, but yeah, they're, they're great. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I mean, they must be comfortable to wear. Otherwise, you know, people wouldn't be using them. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's There's... cool. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Yeah. Cause dental dams, people are like, this is really unsexy. Like, yeah. let me just like oh. stretch out this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> uh -huh. So for folks listening who might want to learn a little bit more about HPV who are like, oh my God, I had an abnormal pap. Like where, where can they find some good information? Like yeah. trusted info. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually um, the, the public health agency of Canada um, has a lot of good uh, information on HPV. There is uh, HPV info that provides a lot of resources for particular HPV vaccine information. The national advisory committee on immunizations in Canada or NACI, NACI has uh, you know, a very, very strong set of recommendations, but the, the long and gist of it is that, Everybody from the ages of nine and up, whether you're a male or a female, regardless of previous exposure or current exposure, doesn't matter. Anybody from nine and up, no upper age limit. If somebody nine and up has never had an HPV vaccine, strongly recommended to go and get it. Yeah. So if you're listening and you have kids. Yeah. Like yeah, it's a no brainer. It really it. is. Yeah. yeah. And even if somebody is married in a stable or monogamous relationship, it doesn't matter go out and get your HPV vaccine because uh, it'll protect against strains to which you're not exposed and it'll prevent recurrences as well. 
Yeah. So I like to end this with asking the Instagram questions that I got. Yeah. If you're open to that right now. Absolutely. Okay. First question. Do internal condoms protect against HPV? Yes. So any kind of physical barrier. So, you know, so any, if the internal condom, the area that it's covers, um, uh, it'll protect against HPV. But unfortunately, there's the other areas uh, because it's skin. And so the other areas that aren't covered by the internal condom are still potential sites of transmission. So it's not going to be foolproof. Great. Thank you. (laughs) Second question. If I have a wart on my finger and I touch my partner on their vulva, will they get HPV from it? Uh, so uh, there's always the the possibility, okay. but we know that the strains of HPV that cause warts um, on the extremities, so outside of the genital area, are usually different than the strains of HPV that cause genital warts. So 6 and 11 are strains that typically cause genital wart lesions, whereas the warts that are caused uh, you know, on your hands and feet or other areas of the body are caused by different strains. So it's less likely, but it's still possible. Okay. Good to know, because I didn't know that one. (laughs) We kind of covered this one. What are the latest recommendations in HPV prevention and treatment? Yeah. So anybody, male or female, from the ages of nine and up, no upper age limit. So if you're 50, 60, 70, I think the oldest couple that I vaccinated was a couple that um, in the male was 82 and the female was 79. And they, yeah, they were living in an assisted living. They were, uh, you know, their uh, husbands and wives um, had long passed away, and but they were still very functional and they were living in a long-term care facility. And they were like, you know what? We've heard about this from our grandkids. Uh, is this something we should do? And they were completely healthy, young, active. I mean, they were functionally like a 50 or 60 year old. So I said, you know what? You have many, many years left to live. Go and enjoy life. And, uh, you know, if you're ever going to become sexually active, then you should do everything to protect yourself. And so I vaccinated them with HPV vaccines. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter what age. Like, yeah, you can no. get freaky at any age. Come exactly, on. Exactly. <laughs> for sure. And especially at that age, too, because you may not be having, like, intercourse, but you can still have foreplay. You can still play around. You can still touch. Right? Why not? Mm-hmm. Live life. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love that. Uh and the last question actually was one that we we covered about my friend wanting to know if she should get her vaccines updated. Okay. Yes. Yes. So absolutely. Yes. It's never a bad idea to get a vaccine. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm like sitting with myself. I'm like, do I have any questions right now? Can anybody like anywhere in the world have access to the vaccine or is there countries that it might not be accessible? Uh, you know, it's it's widely available in over 100 different countries around the world. Some countries may not have approved it, but in most of the developed uh, world, as well as in third world countries, uh, HPV vaccines are widely available. I, I can't say the entire uh, uh, planet um, and in every country it's approved, but for most countries it, it is approved and widely available. Great to know. Yeah, because I have listeners who tune in from yeah. all different areas. I'm like, oh, somebody from India. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, that's a, um, a good point that you raised because we do see uh, quite a few travelers coming from other countries where the HPV vaccines may not be available. So they uh, come to Canada either on vacation or for some other reason, and then while they're here, they get their HPV vaccines. That's a great idea. Mm. I never would have thought of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's something that you can do. You don't need to have an Canada health card, Alberta yeah, health card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because vaccines, uh, somebody can just uh, go into a pharmacy and pay out of pocket. And most pharmacies in Canada are able to inject it uh, right then and there at the pharmacy. Great. But they would have to come back like in two two months is it two months yeah before? so yeah. zero two and six so as long as a minimum of um four weeks has gone between the first and second dose okay. and a minimum of 16 weeks between the second and the third dose then uh, somebody can just continue on uh with the series it doesn't matter if they're late it's just as long as those minimal intervals have gone by then they just finish off uh w- with their next doses great good to know super helpful Thank you, Angel, for coming on here today. I've learned so much. I need, 
like, I have to re-listen to this because I just feel like I was trying to manage my notes and talk to you. And I'm like, there was so much great information. And I really hope that people find a lot of value and, you know, take care of their bodies with this because it is serious and it can like be more complicated than just an abnormal pap or you know, the throat cancer, like men too. We all need to like take our health into our own hands. So thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Tara, for really highlighting this important issue. So I hope that we can educate your audience a bit more so everyone could be more proactive about their health and protect themselves. Yeah, yeah. And if people are wanting to come to the clinic that you're at, Mm-hmm. Are you willing to share that? Or Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So I am based in Calgary, uh, in Alberta here. And yeah, so we have our clinic downtown at the Sheldon Schumier on the fifth floor. And uh, we operate on a walk-in basis, but then the um, patients can also book appointments uh, with the physician as well. So I'd be more than happy if anybody has uh, any questions about HPV or any other STI related question. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you to all of my amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, get social with me. You can follow my show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at Sex Ed for the Modern Bed. Until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. Mm-hmm.